So, we are on to the last topic now, the last major topic uh, that is the conversion process uh, or casting processes, uh, but before I uh, take that up today uh, in the 34th lecture, I would like to you know uh, finish the remaining discussion uh, as far as uh, processing of molten steel in tan dish is concerned. So, the little tan dish and mold setup if I can make a line drawing very simplistic okay. that is and then we have <coughs> so we have a tan dish cover, we have a level cover, we have melt here, we have tan dish powder, we have slag and then we have continuous casting modes, the A C N here and this is R. So, that is the line drawing and <coughs> as I have indicated uh, that the molten metal is going to spend some amount of time in the tan dish and uh, there is a finite residence time under steady state conditions. So, when the inflow and the outflow rate, rate matches Q out the net outflow rate matches with the net inflow rate. In that case, the tan dish is said to be operated under steady state. That of course, we all know from our discussion already. I have said enough about that. The point that I want to stress here that we have seen yesterday uh, uh, in the last lecture that uh, in the tan dish, there is considerable scope for reoxidation of steel and reoxidation is primarily the major chemical reaction that takes place in tan dish and the first reoxidation of course, is because of the dissolution of oxygen from the atmosphere because of the ingression of air or during the initial period of tan dish filling if the tan dish is not flushed then the interaction of molten metal incoming molten metal with the environment within the tan dish leads to oxygen dissolution in molten metal and this oxygen disturbs the aluminum oxygen equilibrium which was prevalent at the little lifting station immediately after VD and as a result of which aluminum inclusions are generated. This is one mechanism of reoxidation uh, and as I have you can you can visualize the same reaction with respect to dissolved magnesium or dissolved calcium also. I need not write that, but it is implicit that if this aluminum, calcium, magnesium being the three most reactive elements which is present in steel at this particular stage and which is of concern to us. And uh, part B uh, or the other route second uh, parallel route of reoxidation is the chemical reaction like the aluminum which is there in the dissolved state and silica which is there in tan dish powder okay, and that reacts and produces L2O3. So, looked at from this standpoints, a tan dish really cannot be regarded as an inert reactor. So, tan dish is a type you know uh, is a reacting system as such we can you know grossly we can visualize loosely we can visualize that as if it is just serving as a buffer vessel uh, you know helping us to distribute molten metal among few molds. Okay. Uh, but if you look at examine uh, the processing of steel in tan dish in great detail, even though we may not be uh, making any additions, even though we do not want uh, any uh, chemical reactions, but these unwarranted chemical reactions nevertheless take place in tan dish to a very degree. Okay. In bad practices, they could be you know dangerously fatal. On the other hand, in very good practices, you cannot as I have indicated totally eliminate oxygen atmospheric air ingression or oxygen dissolution and similarly when you have a tan dish slag containing a reasonable amount of silica uh, the second reaction that I have written between dissolved aluminum and silica can also be prevented and this makes tan dish a reacting flow system and this has con considerable importance uh, influence on the final quality of the product because of the generation of alumina or if we look at if we extend our discussion of calcium oxide or magnesium oxide or combinations of calcium oxide, magnesium oxide, alumina forming double oxides inclusions and so on and so forth. Now, with respect to aluminum, we can uh, you know 
of course, assess that to what extent in the turn dish, uh, what extent the reactions are taking place. So, there are two different phenomena which are taking place in the turn dish simultaneously. One is reoxidation, which is causing alumina to be generated, <coughs> and the other is the flotation of the alumina particles, which are already existing, you know, in the turn dish plus uh, the, those which are generated uh, progressively. So, flotation of inclusions, uh, alumina inclusions, or inclusions of calcium <coughs> and magnesium as well as generation of inclusions because of reoxidation. These are simultaneous phenomena which are taking place in the turn dish. Okay. So, therefore, you know you cannot really visualize flotation in an isolation. I mean if you can now imagine for example, that you, ha you, you have a sample taken from the billet okay, and then you say the inclusions count in billet inclusions in bilateral bloom inclusions in bloom if you measure and that inclusion content should be is equal to whatever was the original inclusion in little or after V d original inclusion plus inclusion generated because of reoxidation due to reoxidation minus the inclusion floated out by flotation or other mechanisms inclusion floated out. So, you can write that balancing balance and as I have indicated that because inclusions and are synonymous with aluminum insoluble. So, this equation and that inclusions which are generated is because of a change in the soluble aluminum. So, therefore, it is possible to mathematically represent this equality in terms of originally present insoluble in inclusions, insoluble aluminum at the V d lifting station okay, that is the original represent, then this is the delta aluminum soluble, soluble because this part whatever is the soluble aluminum okay, uh, and present delta, delta essentially means that between the turn dish inlet and outlet and which is same as here and here. Okay. So, if there is a change in soluble aluminum between these two points, so that means where does that soluble aluminum has gone? The soluble, soluble aluminum can only you know react and get vanished in the insoluble oxides itself. So, we can we can you know look at this that look at the equation that if you balance it, then we can say that for every two moles of aluminum vanishing from the system, soluble aluminum vanishing from the system, one mole of Al2O3 or aluminum inclusions is generated. So, whatever I have written, you know, in terms of inclusions here, that can be interpreted in terms of a change in dissolved soluble aluminum, so dissolved soluble, so, uh, soluble aluminum as well as insoluble aluminum. So, therefore, if you can make a measurement of inclusions in bloom, or if you know that how much of insoluble aluminum is aluminum insoluble is there in bloom that is the left hand side of this equation. Okay. If you know the original inclusion that original inclusion is the aluminum insoluble in V d this is inclusion generated delta aluminum soluble. So, therefore, in terms of three different parameters one is this in terms of this you should be able to by transposing you should be able to arrive at that how much of inclusion has been floated in the turn dish itself. So, I will take this to the left hand side and then I will find out that the inclusion floated I can write down that equation floated in turn dish. is therefore, going to be equal to for example, I will say delta aluminum soluble and this delta essentially indicates the change between this point and this point that is what is delta aluminum and it is a positive quantity. Okay. And then we can say that we have aluminum insoluble in V d and aluminum insoluble. So, this is also delta aluminum insoluble 
because I have subtracted in this insoluble aluminum and this is also insoluble aluminum too. So, if I, when I transpose insoluble V d minus insoluble uh, you know <coughs> this is inclusions in bloom. So, this is one is inclusions in bloom sorry I will correct it and this is inclusions. So, therefore, inclusion aluminum insoluble in V d minus aluminum insoluble in bloom that is what is the delta aluminum insoluble. So, therefore, the inclusions. So, now as I have indicated that by monitoring you know how does the proportion of soluble and insoluble aluminum is changing during the final stage of steel processing one should be able to find out that how much of inclusion has been floated in the tan dish. Okay? And if I divide it by the total inclusions then what I get I know the fraction of inclusions which have really floated and this is a very good prescription you know prescription given that this takes into account the reoxidation because without considering reoxidation you cannot really get you know total inclusions and this total inclusion is nothing but inclusions present in VD plus inclusions which are generated in the system itself. So, this is total inclusion I can say is to be is equal to aluminum insoluble this is the originally present inclusion aluminum alumina inclusions assuming I can have the same thing I am repeating again and again the expression I have written for aluminum if you say that sir I have my calcium in steel I have magnesium in steel in that case you should be able to write similar expressions for them also those species also. So, aluminum insoluble in V d this is the originally present inclusions in steel and this how big or small is this value this determines that how good has been your include you know deoxidation product removal how good has been your steel making practice and this is an index of that and the total inclusions which is generated is actually equal to aluminum delta aluminum insoluble that is what it is. So, this is the total amount of inclusions this is sorry delta aluminum soluble. Because this much of soluble during tan dish process has manifested as aluminum. So, whatever has been vanished, delta aluminum change has taken place, correspondingly, an equivalent or proportionate amount of Al2O3 has been generated. So, this is the reoxidation component, this is the original component, and that is what determines if you divide one by the other, then you get the fraction of inclusions which have been eliminated. So, in an industry, you can now assess you know a tan dish process performance because as I said in the beginning if you remember that you know tan dish we are not looking at tan dish as a reactor per se uh, a tan dish is you know we try to exploit the residence time distribution create surface directed flow and thereby we want to create an environment in tan dish such that inclusions get float out and this prescription allows you to evaluate that how good the tan dish design has been to you. Okay? What are the kinds of flow modifiers you should be using in the tan dish Okay, in order to have adequate inclusion flotation. So, if you have this value very low which essentially tells you that you know uh, tan dish, the tan dish design is not favorable enough. If the situation is dominated by reoxidation, okay, suppose if you have steel making process is very good, your steel making process is very good. In that case these inclusions this is going to be small. On the other hand this is going to be large if your reoxidation practice is very reoxidation is very intense. So, therefore, the value of this will determine okay, and I have given you an expression for flotation also how much of inclusion sorry has generated. So, if this is the reoxidation okay, delta aluminum soluble and if you divide delta aluminum soluble by the total inclusions then you get and this total inclusions are once again I repeat they are not the originally present inclusion at the VD lifting station plus the inclusions which are generated in the tan dish. So, this gives you an idea about the generation how much what fraction of total inclusion has been due to uh, the deoxidation. So, this together with this will allow you you know to quantify the performance of the steel making tan dish system and then you can say you can play with your tan dish furniture etcetera okay, tan dish geometry tan dish throughput rate of course, throughput you cannot control because that is driven by the plant logistics. Okay? So, particularly that what should be the depth of the liquid, what should be the internal furniture designs and so on and so forth which can by which you should be able to minimize reoxidation and then you know get a good flotation of inclusions 
uh, from the Tandish uh, system. So, <coughs> it is very important for us to be able and we, we must know that you know uh, it is very difficult to carry out simulations uh, and then you know predict this kind of a scenario which has generation and flotation bo both because these are highly complex uh, processes and as I have indicated that generation of new phases if you know you know from your deoxidation fundamentals are preceded by nucleation and growth. So, nucleation growth inclusions you know touching with each other as during their rise or coalescing with each other these are all very complicated phenomena the exact physics is also not known. So, therefore, simulation will not allow you to predict and perhaps the best way to do it currently is to you know monitor the plant uh, parameters or uh, parameters in the plant relevant parameters in the plant which will allow you to quantify on site that how good your Tandish design has been with respect to inclusion flotation as well as inclusion generation. And you will you know, so if, if you find that generation is a predominant uh, uh, you know uh, term in the whole thing, then you, uh, you know that generation is because of the shroud. So, you will have you know as well as the two different the, there is no third way of generation of inclusions you know of course, refractories can contribute to inclusions, but that those are all big inclusions and really you know uh, with in the Tandish inclusions form because of the refractory metal interactions. So, you know that your slag chemistry has not been right if reoxidation is predominant you may know that you know you your you know air ingression is very heavy. So, the shroud collector nozzle joint is not right. So, this formulation this evaluation will allow you to tighten your belt and take corrective measures as far as adjusting the composition of slag is concerned as far as you know uh, engineering of the shroud collector nozzle design is concerned. I will also say that in order to minimize air ingression from here uh, typically at the shroud collector nozzle we have argon flushing also okay, and that argon flushing tends to you know provide a shielding scar such that if even if air gets entrained or sucked into the shroud itself it is not 100 percent air it is mixed with 80 percent argon and 20 percent air you know minimizing the extent of air absorption or air ingression into the shroud and the consequent dissolution of oxygen. So, I think I will now wind it up okay, and then we will move on to our uh, next topic which is the final topic and that is uh, the conversion process. Or so, we have start studied extensively the refining process uh, which is in a primary steel making process as well as the secondary steel making process. We have studied uh, the transfer operations and uh, in the case of transfer furnace tapping operation which is also a transfer operation the thrust there was that you know we will not like carry over slag uh, because we know that you know we have subsequent operations and we should be able to control uh, the dissolved oxygen and nitrogen through deoxidation as well as vacuum degassing. So, we are not so much concerned uh, about oxygen getting into steel or nitrogen getting into steel, but we are more concerned there uh, in the context of tapping about the slag oxidizing slag getting carry over into uh, the ladle. On the other hand in the case of timing okay, uh, it is now completely changed and the timing processes or you know the transfer operations between ladle and tandish warrants that we should have minimal slag metal interactions minimum air ingression. So, the atmospheric contact uh, between molten metal and atmosphere must be <coughs> limited to the extent possible and we must now know that you know steel making per se that the quality steel making essentially depends on how effectively you have been able to control gas metal slag refractory interactions. If you have control if you have played your cards well as far as these interactions are concerned uh, the final result in steel is going to be very high in quality and as a result of which will satisfy the customers and ensure prolonged service life which is indeed a desirable parameter showing no untimely failure of particularly the key engineering components. <coughs> so, the conversion process or which you call now casting processes. Okay. Uh, so, refining process, transfer process and conversion process that is what uh, we want to discuss here uh, in the next two lectures uh, or so. Uh, and so, the liquid steel as it is you know uh, uh, refined as well as uh, treated 
in primary steel making vessels as well as little metallurgy steel making now needs to be converted into a solid product and i would like to mention here that even when you do the casting this is not the end of the steel making okay the casting process that you have uh, delivered a product uh, made a you know transformed your liquid steel into solid uh, fair enough but that is not the end of steel making uh, because you will have lot of leverages in terms of controlling the microstructure as well as texture of steel and i would say the final property of steel will a mechanical property of steel is going to be determined you know uh, by its composition by its cleanliness by its microstructure and its texture that again the microstructure and texture control come in a different uh, you know a paradigm so once this is solid state processing of steel we have thermomechanical treatments and various other processes okay uh, whereby you should be able to you know control the grain size etc uh, and also control texture and thereby uh, you know inflict a more uh, better properties into steel but that is not within the purview of this discussion so we will those final finishing operations beyond solidification we will not be talking here that is again you know, that requires a different kinds of an expertise uh, and that is also not a purview of the iron and steel making process uh, the way we have cast it okay or we have formulated before the casting process so we have uh, i would like to give you or revise your fundamentals about the transformation uh, you know of liquid to solid uh, transformation and we know that uh, we are talking about transformation of steel uh, which is essentially an alloy okay so it is not a pure metal and uh, pure metal as we all know solidifies if you draw the time temperature graph in that case we will see that uh, the pure metal will solidify and you know at a temperature and this is a characteristic melting temperature and what i have plotted is temperature as a function of time <coughs> on the other hand you have and all of you may be knowing that you have to go a little bit below the melting temperature in order to give the necessary impetus for uh, the critical nuclei to become stable okay that is necessary but once you have done that stable nuclei has formed the temperature shoots back and the same temperature is maintained <coughs> on the other hand if you go to an alloy we all know that an alloy uh, you know it, it melts over a range of temperature something like this and that's why you see the alloy melting if you look at a simple phase diagram copper nickel phase diagram you can see that you have a phase a liquid plus solid so if you take the solid here and then you understand this is temperature and this is composition and you see that this is the liquidest temperature and this is the solidest temperature between the liquidest and the solidest temperature you know you have both the phases coexisting which essentially tells uh, that there are two phases simultaneously existing and so is here that you have two phases existing the melting initiates here and over a range of temperature the melting you know takes place and then so this is pure metal and this is an alloy carbon alloy as we all know will solidify over a range if you look at the top part of the iron carbon phase diagram carbon you know, we have something like this this is the 1539 degree that is the melting point of iron at one atmosphere pressure and this is uh, the delta plus liquid phase i have drawn it you know not the full diagram uh, one can draw the i can draw the full diagram but that is not the issue the point i want to make here that as percentage carbon increases okay the liquid has slopes downward which essentially means that, uh, that there is a depression in the melting point okay so that is why uh, the melting point of pure iron is 1539 on the other hand if you have 0.1 percent carbon uh, that will melt at a temperature maybe at 15 20 degree 15 uh, 15 degree and so on and so forth in alloy steels there is a terminology called equivalent carbon that is used you know in a loose way that because there are other alloying elements also so an equivalent carbon is 
use for example if you have silicon if you have manganese if you have titanium all this you know they have their coefficients is empirically determined and there are equations for equivalent carbon. So, given the composition okay, one can find out the equivalent carbon then take that equivalent carbon project it up and find out that what should be the melting temperature of that particular alloy. This is not I just wanted to introduce you the terminology of. So, in alloy steel equivalent carbon is a very important term just in plain carbon steel we know that <coughs> as carbon content increases okay, and we also know that as carbon content increases the density goes down uh, the melting temperature uh, less amount of heat is going to be necessary and that is what we have seen that when we put scrap in an LD converter the scrap will penetrate the hot metal okay, blast furnace hot metal because there is a carbon rich. So, that is much lighter. So, that will tend to float up. So, the uh, you know the scrap which is pure iron will exp, you know go vertically downward the buoyancy is going to be less than the gravity force which is going to settle at the bottom. But as the metal becomes you know impure the impure metal floats at the top and the pure metal settles at the bottom by rule of uh, their differential density. In industries uh, apart from we are not talking about foundries okay, in steel making industries mostly we will uh, be solidifying molten metal in metallic molds and these molds could be cast iron molds and these molds could be uh, you know copper molds. In continuous casting we use copper mold uh, because of the simple fact that the residence time or the dwell time of steel, steel enters here stays for you know less than a minute and then it comes out. So, we want heat to be extracted very fast because we want to have a solidified not complete solidification of course, is possible here, but partially solidified. So, that we can have a scenario like this if this is a round bloom in that case at the mold exit the scenario could be something like this that we have a shell which is formed and this is going to be the liquid that is which the section of the casting is here. So, because of short dwell time we will require you know uh, at high thermal conductive material. So, more mold material in continuous casting is um, copper on the other hand in uh, ingot casting process we have uh, we use mostly cast iron molds. Now, so metallic molds are used and one important aspect of the metallic mold is that if you look at the cross section suppose I just want to explain the principle uh, that metal upon solidification we all know uh, it undergoes shrinkage. Okay. So, therefore, we can expect that the volume of the metal upon solidification is going to be smaller than the mold volume. And we know that solidification is not going to be instantaneous as you know it has to depend on the rate of the heat extraction and there is significant build up of resistance on the path of heat flow as solidification process these things we all know from transport phenomena fundamentals. So, this ingot yesterday if you remember that I told you that if you have a 3 point you know um, 7 million ton steel plant two blast furnace operating uh, each 3.5 million ton and you have an oxygen steel making converter or two oxygen steel making converters on a daily basis you churn out about 10,000 uh, you know tons of hot metal. And yesterday I said that you know you require about 1000 assuming that you have 10 tons uh, in got uh, to be produced mold capacity mold uh, volume mold will contain each mold will correspond to about 10 tons of in got which essentially tells that you have you have to have 10,000 uh, you know 1000 uh, molds uh, to be required on the daily basis. Because these molds cast iron molds uh, if you look at uh, you know say 10 ton as I said in got. So, the mold will also roughly be a about 10 uh, you know somewhere between 8 to 10 tons in weight. So, the heat lost by uh, the ingot the solidifying ingot is absorbed bulk of it is absorbed by the mold material itself because the mold is massive. So, initially the mold when you start the process of teaming material into the metallic mold if particularly for ingot casting the mold is at room temperature. Okay. So, therefore, I say 10,000 uh, 1000 moles because you know one mold after filling it will take some time 
for stripping, removing and then it will take maybe 24 hours before the mold can be recycled back because I want the mold's temperature to go down again from the room because the mold is going to absorb take the heat. That is the whole objective of having such having such a massive molds in the in got casting process itself. On the other hand in continuous casting we will see that there is a force cooling system. Okay. So, there is a liquid to solid heat transfer in the case of uh, you know in got casting process. So, and the mold material is going to be mostly taking away the heat and this mold material. So, as casting goes on the you know time passes the casting temperature will go down as the mold wall temperature is going to increase as a function of time and you will see that at the end of the process when you strip the mold you know 75 to 80 percent of the heat has been taken up by the mold itself. Okay. And that is an impart, important aspect of the whole thing, but in this particular case there is cooling water and that cooling water really takes away the heat itself. Of more importance in the context of solidification is this gap which is produced as a result of the shrinkage of the molten material. It detaches itself from the mold wall and as a function of time, so you have poured molten material into the ingot mold. So, after some time itself you will see there is a gap which is being created because the mold has started material ingot has started to contract and the mold has started to expand because the mold temperature and the ingot's temperature are changing in a reverse direction. If you do the time temperature plot, okay, the ingot temperature would be you know, decreasing like this. On the other hand, the mold temperature would be increasing like this. That is the way it is going. So, ingot this is the mold increasing and then got continuously decreasing. So, right from the beginning itself when some solidification is taking place. So, the gap is generated and this gap you know what it contains is air which is a very poor conductor of heat. It provides large resistance uh, to uh, the solidification process. So, in industrial casting processes therefore, we will try to fill up this gap with some kind of a uh, you know liquid powder material okay, of which we call as a mold powder. So, mold powder essentially replaces the non-conducting air and the mold powder will fill up the volume and as a result of which what is what we are going to have now is between the ingot mold wall okay, and the casting solidifying casting the space is going to be occupied by mold powder which will be partly liquid and partly solid. And because it will replace drive out the air and as a result of which uh, what happens is uh, the rate of heat conduction or heat flow is going to be substantially increased. So, therefore, casting processes rarely we will will be uh, you know using without any mold powder and the reasons for using mold powder is to expedite the rate of solidification and so on and so forth. But this is a very slow process because then you have a solid here after some time a solid layer is solidified. There is a solid plus liquid because there is a powder and there is another solid this solidification is going to be quite small. On the other hand in this case the rate of solidification could be very rapid okay. and we will see that what are the various paraphernalias and continuous casting setup of which will you know extract heat. So, a 10 ton you know in got for example. Uh, can take uh, something like uh, uh, ingot stripping town time about 5 hours and complete solidification time could be about 8 hours 10 hours or something like that. But in this particular in this case you know in 10 hours of time 100 tons of material uh, can be uh, solidified because yesterday I have told you that from the ladle you know you may have about 5 or 7 tons of material coming in if you have 3 tons of material coming in here in 10 hours you can imagine that how much of material you have been able to continuously cast. So, this is a rate of heat transfer is very very slow the rate of heat transfer is very very large and therefore, we understand that the chances of crack formation etcetera is going to be very heavy in this particular case than it is in this particular case. We will discuss all these things when you talk about the defects in the casting processes and so on and so forth. So, the moment molten metal is poured into uh, an ingot mold a metallic mold we all know 
that we have a chilled layer which forms because there are multiple nucleation sites and as a result of which if you have this as the mold I am drawing the cross section of the mold. And then we can see that we have you know tiny crystals because enormous number of nucleation sites can be there because the mold wall is small and the what we form here is known as the chilled zone which has huge you know nucleation sites and very small number of and then predominantly we have a columnar grains after following a chilled layer okay. and in this case the heat extraction is in this way and the growth of the grain is in the reverse direction and ultimately okay and they are growing from the both sides okay and then we have so they have a as you can see the chilled crystals they have a, they look like spherical so their major and minor axis looks like similar but on the other hand this seems to be elongated and the elongation direction you know, they have directional properties okay on the other hand chill zones have do not have directional properties in the process of forming these crystals or these grains what happens the liquid ahead of this as we all know undergoes constitutional supercooling and the liquid is going to be now progressively richer because of throwing of the solute elements uh, into the liquid which is ahead of the columnar grains itself. So, again because of constitutional supercooling we will have multiple nucleation sites and as a result of which we can have you know equiex grains. Of course, the average grain size is going to be much more larger than the chilled grain and so on. So, this is a typical characteristics of uh, a structure of uh, a, 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 a ringot you know which is produced uh, from uh, by using a metallic mode. So, this is the direction in which <coughs> we have chilled zone, columnar zone and equiex zone and this equiex zone uh, forms as a result of constitutional supercooling and we all know uh, and then uh, there is a defect also here which we call a scoring which we have learnt in our you know undergraduate uh, uh, foundry or uh, solidification courses uh, and this micro segregation which takes place in the system because first crystal to form from equilibrium diagram as you have read in your second year metallurgy is pure and the last in got last part which solidifies becomes impure. So, there is a huge uh, difference excuse me uh, difference between you know the solute concentration at this particular point and this particular point and that uh, contributes to what is known as scoring defects in casting and to eliminate scoring defects we also know from our physical metallurgy course that we will heat up the ingot and as a result of which what happens is the diffusion uh, is going to be diffusion coefficient is going to be higher at higher temperature and that there is a concentration gradient between various points diffusion fluxes will be set up and as a result of which homogenization is going to take place. So, this is a general feature of you know uh, the casting uh, or the you know solidification uh, process and with this little background let us now uh, there is just a revision and I think most of it you know will go and provide a description of the two casting processes which I would like to you know discuss briefly uh, which is ingot casting and uh, continuous casting process. Continuous casting is the dominant technology okay, uh, of casting today in steel industry because of obvious uh, you know, technological advantages which I will outline uh, later on after I finish uh, discussing the ingot casting process. So, in ingot casting first thing is that so we have a little we have a timing device that how you are going to team it okay. and we also have there is no turn dish there is no casting there is no continuous casting but there is a mold here and that mold can have various cross sections where, where square is one round is very popular ones hexagonal molds are these are very popular kind of molds that we can use and these molds are massive as I say as massive as, as their capacity. We, we make uh, pencil ingots also very small ingots 
on the other hand we made very large ingots also. Today uh, 150 ton size ingots are very common and uh, you know there are even you know uh, indication that 600 ton size ingots have also been cast. So, massive ingots and these ingots will take several days uh, to completely solidify it is not so easy to cast you know because through one heat you will not be able to you will have to have three or four levels okay, each containing 150 ton of hot metal and then one after another you will be putting in and there are uh, you know many difficulties associated with uh, casting uh, one single ingot from uh, heats produced uh, you know multiple heats uh, produced in ladles or uh, in primary steel making vessels. So, you can feed a mold with one single ingot one single ladle or if you want to produce a very large size uh, in ingots in that case multiple heats or multiple ladles can be teamed into the same ingot itself and these are all as I said uh, you know made of cast irons and <coughs> this is the typical uh, cross section of molds. Now, uh, the pouring arrangement is a almost similar to what I have shown here ok. I do not want to erase it because I will continue discussing. Uh, so, we have a ladle here and we have from the ladle we have <coughs> this is called the trumpet region and this may be feeding several molds I have drawn as schematic yesterday okay, and then we have so I am showing you so you can have a half shroud kind of a scenario this is what is known as a trumpet come runner and there you can have as I have indicated some argon injection. So, that atmospheric air does not get into steel and this may be your mold ingot mold. The sections of this ingot mold could be anything here. Round ingots are not cast very big I would just like to you know of the discussion mention because the moment to try to cast uh, round ingots. Uh, large hoop stress generated on the you know during the initial stage of solidification. The hoop stress basically is directly proportional to the radius of the ingot and uh, inversely proportional to the thickness. Imagine the first stage of solidification when the thickness is extremely small few microns you know of liquid steel has just solidified and at that time on the rim circular rim the st stress is going to be large and as a result of which you know large ingots are often susceptible to cracks and this tracks cracks because the at high temperature close to 1600 or 1500 degrees centigrade with the strength of steel is not that much okay. And as a result of which uh, what happens is uh, that uh, you know large round ingots form cracks and that is why people normally do not tend to cast large ingots. Instead that kind of a defect is circumvented in large you know hexagonal size you have even 12 faces uh, you know. Uh, dodecahedron kind of a uh, geometry uh, you know uh, from which a circular ingot can be worked out at the end. So, that is just besides the point. So, this is the way teaming is done from the ladles. The ladle is covered nothing changes here and we have slag layer here and I have shown you two ingots ok. Uh, basically you know it could be 10 ingots it could be 8 ingots depending on you know what is the capacity of the ladle and what are the size of the molds and so on and so forth. So, if I have a 50 ton ladle and 2 that means each of the ingot we are talking about is a going to be a 25 ton uh, ingot. So, this is a teaming arrangement here uh, and uh, as you team this uh, mold so ladle we know. Uh, these are all refractory artifacts uh, the trumpet this is called trumpet and this is the runner this is the vertical part of the runner and this is the horizontal part of the runner ok that is what it is 
and the molten metal you know uh, could be teamed from here uh, in about uh, I would say half an hour 50 if you have a 50 ton ladle in half an hour time okay, you should be able to fill up uh, both the models. So, so 25 ton uh, material will go here and 25 ton material will go here okay, and in 30 minutes time 20 minutes time you will be able to empty it. So, there is quite a bit of you know flow inside that is the liquid which is flowing actually okay. and we can the refractory needs to be very good quality otherwise you know huge amount of high, you know, shear stresses etcetera are generated here and the refractory is prone to mechanical way, you know uh, because there is no iron oxide kind of a scenario here which will you know attack the refractories, but on the other hand you know uh, the uh, hydrodynamic shear stresses could be significant particular in the lower part leading to refractory wear. This bottom part these ingots basically uh, they are called wide end up ingots, wide end up moulds or narrow end up moulds and they are uh, they look like something like this they are tapered. Okay. So, one geometry is like this and the other geometry is like this that is what are the two geometries of the ingot. So, this is a narrow end up mold and this is and there is no you know is a one single mold here this is a detachable plate at the bottom there is a detachable plate and then uh, in the detachable plate we have whatever is known as a spigot through which the molten metal uh, flows into the mold. So, when molten metal flows into the mold, so what happens is you know you, you create a fountain kind of a scenario and as a function of time progressively the level of liquid is going to. <coughs> so, this is the spigot or spigot and this is how the molten metal enters and there is a jet and then you know once level of the liquid gets submerged and then as the casting goes on what one does one uses. Uh, what is known as a mold powder and that mold powder basically is you know going to be floating at the top this is lighter and as the ingot tries to shrink because of solidification this is going to be a low melting point oxide powders they are going to be creeping you know ingot shrinking and the mold expanding and between the gap this liquid is going to percolate and as a result of which the air is going to be displaced providing you know good contact between the or lower thermal resistance between the solidifying ingot and the mold itself. Top part of ingot there is a hot top also which is used and this hot top basically has a large thermal you know. Uh, So, these are refractory materials. So, we want molten material to be liquid here because I have told you in the solidification that when you have shrinkage here. So, there are shrinkage cavities also which you know form uh, during solidification. So, to fill that shrinkage cavity we, we, we want molten metal to remain molten here for a prolonged amount of time and that is only possible provided we use not you know metallic uh, mold part here, but we have you know a hot top which is a refractory part which will not absorb the heat too much neither it will allow heat to go out and as a result of which liquid will remain uh, liquid here or molten metal will remain liquid here and if the intrusions etcetera are floating up all the junk is going to be associated you know uh, accumulating here and this is called the hot top. Hot top because it remains hot for a longer amount of time. Why it remains hot? Because it is its walls are all not metallic, but it is a refractory insulating material itself. So, the moment you put it like a hat, okay, what happens is the molten metal which is which is inside that hot top region will remain hot possibly forever okay, because heat is not able to flow. So, the heat flux through the heat top is negligibly small. So, we will continue our discussion uh, 
on this in the next lecture.